outstanding academicians today. First, Mr. Jose Esteve Pardo, visiting from Barcelona, Spain. He's a professor of administrative law in the University of Barcelona. He did his PhD in Munich University as from the University of North Humboldt. He has been a guest professor from Chicago University, and he has taught in several other universities all over the world. He's the member of the Council of Scientific Journals, among them the Public uh, the Administration and the European Journal of Regulation, edited by Cambridge University Press. He has published books in several languages, such as Technique, Risk and uh, Law, Politics and Law, given the uncertainty of science, the new relation between state and society and the warranter state, ideas and reality. Professor Esteve Pardo provides his work called Environmental Justice from the Point of View of Risks. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank you for this invitation. And I would like to say that I am invited once again because I was already invited two years ago. And unfortunately, I couldn't attend due to family issues. And the court has insisted. And I must thank them for insisting, especially Mr. Alejandro Ruiz. The topic that I will talk about today I would also like to thank you for offering me the opportunity to be in Chile. It is a country that I appreciate, and I see that its growth, it's experiencing growth in terms of universities, knowledge, from a critical mass that is very important to researchers, professors, which is absolutely vital for the growth of a country. And it is an investment that we clearly see expressing itself to a series of institutions such as the environmental court, the training that I've seen, and the level of knowledge and sophistication that I have been seen with the previous presentations. It is a country that I greatly appreciate because I have very good friends. And therefore, while in my visit, I have been able to get to know in situ some of the conflicts that are happening right now, such as the case of Quintero that I, I visited, the case of Punta Piquero also. And there's also an anecdote because for the first time I was part of a demonstration here in Santiago and I was able to see live how the water trucks from the police acted. Back in the 70s, we used to see that on the television, but I see that they still use it. I thought that a movie was being filmed here, but I saw that it is a reality. So let's talk about the subject for today, which is this perspective, environmental law from the point of view of risk. And I think that I'm not making any discoveries here because in previous presentations, it has been insisted that this concept is a protagonist. I'm talking about risk. Risk is not only a concept that characterizes environmental law. It is a broader concept that has led to risk society. It is said that we live in a risk society, a society model that was installed some 20 or 30 years ago, but it is here to stay. And let me give you some reasons for this. The risk concept, which is the first element that we should address, is quite simple. 
and of course is not exactly the risk concept provided here in Chile by the general basis law on environment. The risk concept for our purposes is obtained by opposition to the concept of danger. It is purely conventional. And what is danger? It has a natural origin all the time. But dangers or hazards are not only natural risks of floods, tsunamis, earthquakes. They are also the hazards or the dangers that we find in nature in its pure state. And we know that it is not, it's quite hostile. If we were, if we traveled to a natural and unintervened place, we probably wouldn't survive for many days. Why? Because we need food, we need coverage, we need energy, we need heat. And all those elements. The history of humanity is the history on the actions by human beings over nature in order to dominate its hazards or dangers. And that history that mankind has used to control and to reduce the dangers provided by nature is one. And that instrument is technique. Philosopher Ortega y Gasset a Spanish philosopher, very important from the last century, defined technique as everything that is that we have created and that is in between us and nature. That is technique, everything that is between us and nature. We just need to look around the streets of Santiago to realize that our lives is influenced by technique. We live within a technological weaving that is becoming more and more intense. With this, we have been free from several natural hazards. For instance, we can see this in the food industry. In Europe, the first world, as we may call it, in the 20th century, there are millions of people dying of hunger in Ukraine, Russia, in Ireland due to um, disease from potatoes. And this is a horizon that we didn't consider because up to 20, 25, or 30 years ago, the populations were fed directly from nature and they were clearly exposed to all the dangers involved and all the scarcities involved in nature. Now we're not fed by nature, we're fed by an industry, the food industry. Therefore, this is an absolutely radical change that has taken place in many sectors. If we look into the most well-known book, which is the Bible, we find the episode on the fat and thin cows. Cows under very fantastic natural situations and those under difficult situations. But what wasn't considered were the mad cows. So that is the reality. Those are cases that have taken place in Europe. Cases regarding responsibilities in cases of mad cows. So what are mad cows? Mad cows are cows that were intervened technologically. They weren't being fed with grass, but with other food. So they became <clears throat> they started eating meat. And what happens with all this technology that we have developed to dominate nature? All that technology is not safe 
per se. It has its own inconveniences, and we do not call them hazards or dangers anymore. We call them risks. Therefore, risks always involve a technological origin. And in several sectors, we can talk about the risks involved in car, in car accidents. There is a risk that is not provided by the driver. Of course, it is a problem of drivers. It is not a problem of a driver drinking or not. The risk is given by technology, the car itself, because this car weighs two to three tons and it is capable of moving around at 150 or 180 kilometers per hour. That is where the risk is. This is our actions and the level of risks of our actions can be amplified and is amplified, in fact, by technologies of all sorts industrial technologies, and so on. Of course, the environmental law it focuses on this. And it is to control and dominate the risks that we create and that we amplify with different elements and technological uh, structures and the impact that it has on the environment. So, based on this reality that is growing, law has very clear commitments and it has three challenges. So, we expect to get three answers for risks. One is to decide which risks are being accepted and which are being rejected. To decide on what is known, which is a very fundamental legal concept, both in the environmental, civil, or uh, criminal law. This is the allowed risk. The second objective of this law, that risk that has been admitted, how can it be managed? There is a process and an intervention made that is becoming more developed and sophisticated that consists on managing risks. And the third challenge for the law, which is the most controversial one, for which I do not have all the answers or probably very contradictory, how can we assign responsibilities? This is on decisions for risks and risk management decisions. And this is something that I consider very complicated. The decision on risks, we can decide on risks. We generate them, and we can decide on generating them or not. Behind any pharmaceutical product, there is there are several human interventions. In Quinteros, there are many human decisions involved. It is not a natural phenomenon that took place. There are many human decisions made. So risks can be decided, and therefore we need to make a conscious decision. This is one of the fundamental element of the elements of the risk theory that has, for instance, in Chile, very important um, advocates. I can talk about a book on risks and administrative rights. So we can decide on risks. So what do, de do these decisions state? A series of formalities, if it is going to be decided through laws, in other cases, it is decided through referendums. This is if there is a decision that leads to a specific social debate. In Italy, they said we do not want nuclear energy. Then it is subjected to referendum, and then it is decided. In other cases, it is decided through authorizations. And this is for more singular risk decisions, but this decision involves a series of material issues. 
First, the decisions on risks are not absolute or final. They are optional. This says you can choose between one risk or another. You say we do not want nuclear energy, but we are not willing to run out of energy. And therefore, we will have to choose other sources of energy with their corresponding risks. There is something that has been generalized in the entire world jurisprudency. In all jurisdictions, this is in civil, criminal, administrative, national or international courts. And in all of them, we find the same message and the same statement. Well, it is a negative statement, in fact. There aren't any, there isn't such thing as zero risk. And the level of promiscuity that current society has with technology, we are facing several risks. And the idea here is to choose between them. Second, a decision on allowed or permitted risks states another decision that can be even more controversial, which is the distribution of risks. This is something that we have pointed out, and we can choose the risk that this might imply. Chile is a country in which the copper industry thrives a great deal. We are going to work in this industry, and the economic activity pretty much is around copper, and we therefore have to assume the risks of copper production or we'll have to size them and to see up to what point those risks exist. But that uh, decision that might be of a legislative characteristic will have to lead us towards the distribution or how this risk is shared. There is a series of aspects that we have to look into, as it is the case of Quinteros. There is a series of industries within Chile that can install themselves, operate, and we can carry out these industrial processes. But then we have to wonder where. This is not just a territorial or land distribution issue, which is sometimes the most invisible one. We accept nuclear power. OK. Then the second issue, where are the nuclear power plants to be installed? But it's not only a territorial issue, but we have a risk distribution based on social groups. And sometimes implicitly or explicitly, law is offering uh, solutions. The risk distribution between distributors and consumers, risk distribution between the patients and producers, is if, we, if we speak of the risks of the pharmaceutical industry. There's something occurring here, and those risks, how are they going to be distributed? Legislation tends to provide the answers. It's legislation at the very end, and according to the options, in terms of regulating the responsibility or liability, and it will be supported by the producer or the consumer, these are decisions that have to be adopted and take place in relation to risks. But then we have another important aspect, a material one. And in these days, it has flourished in quite a recurrent way in the Environmental Tribunal of Santiago, the three environmental tribunals based on the configuration they hold is who decides upon risks. We must decide, but who is to do so? And the largest issue that is set forth is the following. You might wonder who decides. Well, is it, is it the bodies, the bodies that are enabled to adopt determined decisions? But then we 
look into the hard and complex element of risk, which is the lack of knowledge. Saying so, it is uncertainty. Risks, we are speaking of eventual or likely events. When there's already damage taking place, there is no risk. Risk is always within uncertainty in the complex scenarios. So who might have the knowledge, the know-how, who might operate in complex scenarios, who may clarify this? It's the parliament. And then you wonder if the experts have to intervene, or is it science that has to intervene? That is where we set an issue of legitimacy, an important legitimacy issue, that conflict that is already set in broader terms that, that will solve a conflict in the future in formal legitimacy or constitutional legitimacy or legitimacy that has been built thoroughly throughout history. There is a process in which who decides? Is it the government, the division of powers? Up to where is it the mission of a court, of a tribunal? Then we see legitimacy based on knowledge. Therefore, I am not part of that constitutional structure, but I'm the expert. These are the experts related to that topic. And these are one of the issues of the risks under which I'll dedicate the final part of my intervention. It's quite key and complex within science and legislation. In brief words, the second level of regulations on risks, it's not based on decisions, it's based on management. We have a, admitted something we are going to control, we are going to monitor. So what is the essential or core element that we seek in that second phase of management? What we seek is also key within risks, which is knowledge. Therefore, we will look into what we have authorized. What are the effects in time? Why? Because maybe the level of risks that might be unleashed are quite superior than what we thought of at the very beginning. Then there's a, lo a whole other line of thinking that is not projected in the pr activity of the risk, but a whole important sector and an increasing business in the economic field, in the environmental field. It is the knowledge of technologies, of technologies that mitigate this risk. It is possible that throughout time, we might find a new sort of technology. For instance, the issue of Quintero were to reduced in half of its effect. Bermuda spoke about this previously, what we have declared or not. We might have technologies that are capable of mitigating efficiently the pollution. And I've heard quite a great deal about this in my stay here. There are experts, there are carbon technologies that can be cleaner than the ones that we currently use. Therefore, knowledge is crucial. Then we see the other problem. Saying so, it is a problem related to liability. It's quite complex, and why? On the one hand, and quite essentially, the risks regarding the decisions made on risks as they are adopted in an environment of uncertainties, these are decisions as adopted, so to say, blindfolded. These are decisions under which the organization wishes to decide upon the experts or scientists what kind of risks does this present? And the answer of scientists is that they do not know. Or there's a certain discrepancy, or quite often there's a broad discrepancy in the scientific community. Another answer that can be given by scientists that takes place quite frequently is that we require a 10-year 
plan, 20-year plan. This is something that we're studying. We need more cases, more evidence. We need more statistics to be able to provide a safe response. We have a jurisdictional system that cannot wait 20 years. The jurisdictional system is not 100% related with the scientific system because we have a jur jurisdictional system that has many paradigms. I'll highlight two of them that are, that are quite crucial in this regard. Firstly, the paradigm of decisions. The excellent briefing of the Professor Juan Carlos Ferrada has been a briefing of different decision reviews of the tribunals and so on. We have a jurisdictional system that is guided towards decision making. The environmental tribunal has to decide. The administration that is presented a file has to decide, has to rule upon it, and if not, there is a silence that forces us to that decision, the administrative tribunal. Therefore, we have to decide on a matter and the scientists say we need 20 years. Or the scientists may say the language of science nowadays has changed. And that, for instance, Karl Popper, the philosopher on science, detects it in the 1920s. Science does not speak of certainties, it speaks of likelihoods. Therefore, if we look towards scientists, the answer provided by them will not be the one of a, uh, of a sure certainty unless the whole scientific community is 100% in accordance to that decision. They will just hand us likelihoods. And there's another paradigm of legislation because we have a jurisdictional system built upon the idea of safety. Safety of certainty. Jurisdictional safety is also a key aspect. So one of the main problems, one of the largest issues in environmental law and that will also be present in the immediate future it is how we are able to decide in environments of recognized or acknowledged uncertainty in the scientific community where scientists have said, we do not know. We simply do not know or we need a 10, we need 10 years. How is it possible to reach a decision? How do we establish the mechanisms of action and how do we allocate the responsibility? What's the responsibility of the French Minister of Sanity when there's AIDS, when we did not know anything about AIDS in the past? And there are scientists that say, we have no idea what this disease might imply, but we believe that one of the uh, its transmission is throughout blood blood transplants. What do we do? Should we leave France without any blood uh, transplants? We would go to the blood banks and should we throw them to rivers or should we continue performing blood transplants? But in that moment in time, we had to face that challenge. The minister declares that this is an issue and scientists say, well, that's your issue. We will only be able to tell you what we knew in that moment. But the one that had to adopt the decision was the minister. This is a completely serious issue. Therefore, in this challenge that we face, we are observing clear views in legislation. But on behalf of law and jurists, there's a scientific approach to be able to provide the appropriate scientific solution when many times scientists do not hold that decision. And here, if you may allow me so, with this I will finish my speech, which is the reference to a very important matter that we face in Europe. I don't know if it's here. It's Roman law. Romans, great jurists that have influenced noticeably in our system also faced the issue of uncertainty. This is 
when uh, Centurion went with Caesar to a campaign, he came back victorious under the Ark of Triumph, and then that Centurion didn't come back. What happened? He either died or he lived. But the judges of Roman law didn't want to look for scientific truth of this person living or not. They said, we have a series of legal issues. If this person did not come back, then we have a series of problems that we need to solve. We do not have to be prophets or know or conduct an investigation to see if this person is living or not. There are other problems. The uh, wife is now a widow. She can remarry. His children inherit whatever he had. And then the position that he used, he, he fulfilled in the army can be filled by someone else. And they said, there is a solution. It is presumptions. If this person does not appear for 35 years, it is presumed that he is dead. That is the solution given to these problems, not to look for objective or scientific truth. Currently, I think that we need to recover those ways to decide on law. This is to a situation of fictions, of presumptions, because there we can become overwhelmed by a scientific complexity that scientists themselves cannot respond to in many cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Now, we will listen to the speech of Amanda and Doctor of Law, Directora Interina of New England, Australia. She is also an Associate Professor and Acting Director of the Australian Center for Agriculture and Law. She has a vast experience in interdisciplinary research on effective agro-environmental issues. Since 2013, one of her focus of investigations has been the governance of extractive resources, especially in rural communities. She is presenting her work called Environmental Justice in Australia. Have a very interesting and uh, extensive program. My task here today is to provide an academic perspective on environmental justice, uh, and in particular in the context of Australian research on the subject. Certainly in the academic arena, there's been much uh, fruitful and rich theoretical debate on the topic of environmental justice. And we've had scholars arguing uh, quite long about the contours of the term. What do we mean by the concept of the environment? What do we mean by justice? And does the concept mean different things in different geographical locations? In recent years, there has been significant attention paid to the concept of environmental justice in Australia triggered particularly by the rapid expansion of large-scale coal and coal bed methane developments. In my presentation today, I will reflect on how the concept is understood and how it is being utilised in these disputes in Australia from the perspective of community groups and the environmental movement more broadly. I will finish by reflecting quickly on some of the opportunities to improve access to environmental justice. Over the last few years, I've been exploring case studies of land use conflict concerning extractive developments. It is fair to say that many of these disputes have raised uh, issues of environmental justice. They have pitted the local distribution of environmental and social risks against broader regional and national energy and economic security arguments. These competing factors have raised questions of equity 
in the distribution of benefits and burdens, including water and soil contamination, residential amenity, and impacts upon wilderness areas. However, there have also been concerns raised about the process of land use decision making, including limited opportunities for public participation, the power of industry to frame the scale of project assessment and evaluation, the narrow scope to challenge development decisions, and the marginalisation of those opposed to development. In opposing these developments, communities have drawn on the language of environmental justice to advance their claims. In order for the concept of environmental justice to have relevance and meaning, it is important for it to be situated and contextualised. Today I will talk about environmental justice as it has developed and is still developing in the Australian context and how this contributes to a very rich and plural understanding of environmental justice that can in turn be used to evaluate cases of injustice. Environmental justice is arguably a difficult concept to define with any great uh, precision. Many recognise that it has its roots in uh, the 1970s and 1980s in the United States, particularly the Warren County case in North Carolina, which saw a toxic waste dump purposefully uh, located next to a poor uh, and marginalised black community. This case and several others at the time led to the conflation of environmental justice with the concept of environmental racism, which, while not inaccurate, certainly saw other cases of disadvantage excluded from the environmental justice frame. While race was undoubtedly a major trigger of the environmental justice movement, other discourses have since linked environmental justice to issues of gender, as well as class and social disadvantage. In the Australian context, the concept of environmental justice finds its history in a number of diverse cases of disadvantage. We've had fundamental questions of fairness and equity raised in environmental conflicts ranging from nuclear testing on Indigenous land through to the siting of toxic chemical facilities and landfills. Unlike the United States and perhaps other locations, there has been very little in the way of purely distributional analyses which seek to map the spread of environmental harm along the lines of race and class. Instead, the discourse in Australia is very much shaped by claims around a lack of information about environmental uh, participation, uh, uneven access to resources and expertise, uh, lack of meaningful engagement of all stakeholders, and overwhelmingly the rights of communities, regardless of class or geographic location, to function and flourish. One recent example that brings all of these various threads together is the Hazelwood mine fire in Victoria from 2014, uh, where a bushfire ignited an open-cut brown coal mine that was situated only a few hundred metres from the town of Morwell. And that fire burned for 45 days, spewing out toxic smoke and ash. Soon after the fire started, residents began to report respiratory problems, uh, sickness from alleged carbon monoxide poisoning, and also damage to their property. And yet it was weeks before Morwell's most vulnerable residents were evacuated, and several more until the fire was ultimately extinguished. Morwell is one of the most disadvantaged communities in the country, with low education levels, an above average elderly population, and also low rates of internet connectivity. And these factors were all critical to how this, this particular case was responded to. And ultimately, the response of the government was inadequate in the circumstances. There were limited efforts to engage the community meaningfully in the aftermath of the event. And all of this put together led many commentators to characterize the Hazelwood mine fire as one of the most uh, significant environmental injustices in Australia. So when we think about what constitutes environmental justice, certainly in, in the Australian context, distribution is still very much at the core of the concept. Distributive environmental justice, of course, is concerned with the equitable sharing of environmental benefits and burdens across the population. And it looks predominantly to the geographic distribution of impacts. Who gets what? Who is impacted and how? 
and what is the justification for distribution. Injustice is found in patterns of unfair distribution. Gas and mineral resource development provide an interesting uh, case study for the assessment of fair distribution. Because of the fixed nature of such resources, typical analyses of siting along the lines of class and race often prove problematic. Where intense local impacts are produced, at what scale then should the benefits of developing a resource be assessed and ultimately distributed? So in these cases, and it is these sorts of cases that I have been focusing on in my own research, it becomes necessary to interrogate who has the power to set the scale of assessment. Who should make the decision that regional economic or energy security interests should prevail over intense local environmental and social impacts? To that end, in the Australian context in particular, it has been necessary to include other elements of justice when exploring cases of alleged environmental injustice. Procedural justice is concerned with how decisions are made and who makes them, whether those impacted by environmental risks and harms have adequate notice about the decisions that, infect, that affect them. How well are they consulted? Can they actually participate in decision making? And is there access to an independent and impartial tribunal to review decisions? This concept has been discussed at length by other presenters in this forum. But what I will say with respect to the Australian experience is that unlike other countries that are parties to the Aarhus Convention, or which have constitutional safeguards for citizens' rights in environmental matters, Australia has limited provisions for procedural environmental justice and the limited provisions that we do have have been continually under threat for, uh, for several years. While it is true that environmental impact assessment and other processes do contain requirements for public consultation, there are no safeguards for the integrity of public participation. Frequently, public participation extends only to the provision of information, and that information is often not required to be distributed until after a project application has been prepared. Procedural requirements for public participation in Australia generally do not ad uh, adequately address practical challenges like geographic, educational or economic constraints. There are typically no mechanisms to ensure adequate consideration of the inputs of public petition as participation as well, and there are no ongoing uh, community engagement mechanisms in place in many circumstances either. To that end, some scholars have argued that focusing only on distributional and procedural aspects of justice provides a truncated view of environmental justice. The structural context in which decisions are made also must be taken into account. And this is where we come to the idea of interactional or recognition justice. This is concerned with who is valued and who is given respect in the decision-making process. Is public participation actually recognised and meaningfully considered? Are alternative discourses or particular vulnerabilities accounted for and acted upon? Misrecognition in social and political spheres, such as the pejorative labelling of those who are opposed to development, can actually result in the devaluation of particular perspectives. Contemporary perspectives on environmental justice typically now interrogate matters such as politics, power, and the ability for all stakeholders to be recognised. Of particular relevance here is the dominance and preference for hard scientific data, such as economic cost-benefit analyses, over place-based and cultural values which are difficult to quantify and can thus become obscured in assessment processes. When we consider each of these threads of justice, it becomes increasingly clear, certainly in the Australian context and also in other jurisdictions, that environmental justice must be a broad and very plural concept that takes account of the actual capabilities of communities and of individuals to live the life that they want to lead. And to that end, environmental justice scholars such as David Schlossberg in the United States 
have suggested that we need to look at environmental justice through this overarching uh, prism of capabilities. The concept of capabilities, in its most simple construction, assesses well-being according to what capabilities individuals and groups possess and whether they can function in the manner that they desire. Under a capabilities assessment, the measure of justice is whether or not particular laws or institutions expand or contract the ability for people to function. I mentioned earlier the preference for hard economic data in development assessment decisions over so-called soft, place-based perspectives. The inability for groups and for individuals to express things like social and emotional connections to place within development assessment processes can restrict the capabilities of individuals and of communities to participate meaningfully in development assessment uh, processes. And ultimately, it impairs their capacity to have control over their environment and their future. So what does all of this mean in practice? As I mentioned within Australia, the language of environmental justice is increasingly being deployed to critique a range of environmental decisions, from the Hazelwood mine fire to approval processes for large coal and coal seam gas developments and also wind farms. I wanted to take the time now to explore one of the case studies that I have examined which demonstrates how a broad and plural understanding of environmental justice helps us to see fully the many ways in which access to justice can be constrained and, importantly, how it can be remedied. Some of you may have heard of the Bulga case, which came before Chief Justice Brian Preston of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. Bulga is a small village in the Upper Hunter Valley region of New South Wales, and it's situated close to the integrated Mount Thorley Walkworth open cut mine. It has a population of just under 500 residents, around 20% of whom are employed in the local coal mining industry. In Bulga, the Mount Thorley Walkworth coal mine, which has been operating since 1981, sought to expand its operations in 2010 in light of the burgeoning price of coal. And that expansion application sought to bring the mine within two and a half kilometres of the village of Bolga, as well as clear an additional 700 hectares of land. And this land included around 68 hectares of an ancient dune landform, the Walkworth Sands Woodland, which was a unique ecological community home to threatened flora and fauna species. And I just wanted to show you briefly uh, this time-lapse footage. If you focus on the two mines in the middle there, that's Mount Thorley and Walkworth, you'll see how much they've uh, basically come together since the opening of operations to the present day, uh, and of course the spread of other mines in the nearby um, locality as well. So as you can see, the village of Bolga, which is situated uh, just on the edge of the park there, has all but become swallowed up by these uh, mines. So when the price of coal soared in 2008, the mine proponent Rio Tinto sought to expand both the physical boundaries of the mine as well as the life uh, of operation of the mine. In 2010, the application was lodged with very limited engagement with the local community. For example, the application was open for comment for a period of six weeks, which was required under the legislation, and information was provided to the community largely in digital form, difficult for many of the local residents to access uh, who were largely elderly and not particularly computer literate. The project was assessed by the Planning Assessment Commission, who's an administrative decision body responsible for planning assessment decisions. A public meeting was held where residents had between five to ten minutes each to address the Commission about their concerns. In 2012, the Commission handed down its decision uh, and they approved the mine expansion. And it was acknowledged that while the mine would have a serious impact on the community, possibly radically altering it or even rendering the community non-viable, they noted that approval was inevitable, given the substantial economic benefits to be gained both at the regional and the national scale. In reaching this conclusion, the scale of assessment became very firmly entrenched at the regional and national level, 
prioritising economic prosperity over local environmental and social burdens. A local resident group then lodged an appeal with the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. And for those who aren't familiar with the court, it is a specialised environment court which, among other functions, can hear appeals against administrative decisions on development approvals, and it requires the judge to effectively stand in the shoes of the original decision maker. Uh, so they consider the matter afresh in terms of its environmental, social and economic impacts. As many of you would be aware, lodging a matter such as this, uh, an appeal, is not an easy task. The community had to raise its own funds to gather uh, expert evidence to bring before the court, and the publicly funded Environmental Defenders Office acted on their behalf. It was characterised at the time in the media as a true David and Goliath battle. The community argued that the increased mine activity would result in significant detrimental social and environmental impacts. In particular, they provided evidence of the significant impacts that the expansion would have on biological diversity and endangered ecological, ecological communities, and also the impacts upon community well-being and cohesion. They tendered evidence of the stress, sleep deprivation and anxiety that current mine activities had brought about and argued that further loss of residential amenity would erode their sense of place, causing solastalgia. Now, this novel term, new concept, is a play on the word nostalgia, and it attempts to offer a means by which the psychological effects of place change and the inability to find comfort in one's surroundings can be articulated. Now, while the court was ultimately not convinced of the research methodology around this concept of solastalgia, it agreed with the submissions of the community and found that approval of this mine would result in an exacerbation of the loss of sense of place and would materially and adversely change the sense of community of the residents of Bolga and the surrounding countryside. Chief Justice Brian Preston found that the, economics, uh, the economic benefits to be derived from the expansion were inadequate to outweigh the significant environmental and social costs. And in considering the fact of distributional justice in, in particular, His Honour reflected on concepts of intergenerational and intragenerational, intragenerational equity and considered that the, uh, the original Commission had not given these factors significant consideration in reaching their uh, decision. So in weighing up these factors, uh, as he was required to do under the legislation, Chief Justice Preston reoriented the scale of assessment away from that dominant economic paradigm to one that linked the broader benefits of resource consumption to the intense uh, environmental and social impacts that would be unfairly borne by the community. The mine proponent, unsurprisingly, appealed the decision the next day. However, what was of greater interest in this case were all the factors happening in the background. The chief executive of the mine's parent company was permitted private meetings with the government, while the community was not afforded the same opportunity. The Minister of Planning lodged a cross appeal, effectively joining the company in challenging the court's decision. Other discursive tactics were employed to downplay that local scale while boosting the profile of the broader economic and uh, energy security frame. There were prominent opinion pieces taken out by the company in national newspapers. Claims were advanced by the company in the media that job vulnerability would result uh, following a failure to approve the mine expansion. And the company even sponsored a very popular regional football team uh, who subsequently dedicated one of their matches to supporting uh, employees of the mine. So increasingly there was this dialogue emerging in the public discourse that there was a great importance and need for reinforcing that national economic scale while simultaneously downplaying the impacts at the local level. And then a matter of weeks before the appeal took place, the government introduced a new policy to guide decision makers in their assessment of extractive development decisions which introduced a new clause for decision makers, namely that they must prioritise the significance of a resource 
with regard to the economic benefit at the regional and national scale of developing the resource. So while the appeal against Chief Justice Preston's decision was afoot, further developments were still to come. The Environmental Defender's Office, who uh, ran the case on behalf of the community, had all of its funding removed by the federal government. Uh, and the same happened to equivalent offices around the country. This was also followed by the removal of legal aid funds for public interest litigation at the state level. But despite all of these actions, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the appeal against Chief Justice Preston's determination. And one year after the uh, original decision, they affirmed Chief Justice Preston's decision and rejected all grounds of appeal lodged by the company. But this was to be a shallow victory for the community. The proponent within the new policy environment was able to simply re-lodge new applications under the changed policy setting. Two new applications were lodged, running to some 4,000 pages, with again six weeks provided to the community to review them. The community was also no longer in a position to challenge the approval in court because the minister had on this occasion directed that the Planning Assessment Commission conduct a public hearing as opposed to a public meeting which had taken place initially. The Planning Assessment Commission has two types of uh, public uh, consultation that it engages in. One is a public meeting and one is a public hearing. The conduct of both of these types of public forum are very similar but the key distinction between them is that where a public meeting is held, appeal rights to the Land and Environment Court are preserved. Where a public hearing is ordered, there are no rights of appeal uh, for the merits, on the merits of a decision. And so all of a sudden we had these uh, bureaucratic decisions being made that a public hearing was the most uh, appropriate forum uh, for these events, which basically closed off further avenues. The new development application was reviewed by the Planning Assessment Commission and given that changed policy context, it was ultimately approved. And while the controversial policy amendment that prioritised the significance of the resource in terms of its economic benefit was ultimately removed, it was of little comfort to the community who had already lost all avenues to challenge the decision. So through these scale framing processes achieved through the company's access to the media, but also their formidable lobbying efforts, the proponent was able to position this application as urgent and necessary for the economic growth of the region and of the state. Place-based concerns about the environment, about the impact upon the community, were factors that could be mitigated, compensated or offset. The simultaneous downplaying and discrediting of the communities concerned led those who opposed this particular development to be characterised as self-interested, further marginalising their case. Meanwhile, the government supported the efforts to marginalise the communities by deploying new policies which effectively endorsed and normalised the actions of the company. The footage that I've got on the screen now is of some recent drone footage of dust arising from the mine, and it gives you a sense of the impact where Residents are now located within two kilometres uh, of this particular development. It's not uncommon uh, for land use development disputes to play out with local opposition facing powerful proponents who have access to limitless resources and political power. But what was interesting in this case was how the law was used effectively to normalise a power imbalance by redirecting that scale of assessment. The community lacked power because of their small population size and their limited resources, and also because their interests were framed as marginal repeatedly. They were not able to adequately quantify their interests and concerns within the narrow economic confines of project assessment. So from an environmental justice perspective, the Bulga story is not one of a community that has been historically burdened or discriminated against. Rather, it shows how environmental justice can manifest itself through the strategic manipulation of scales of assessment to delegitimise local concerns, even where such concerns were validly uh, recognised in a superior court of record. 
environmental injustice exists where, as one commentator puts it, participants, subjects or features of environmental disputes are ignored, are overlooked or their interests are downplayed. There is no doubt that this community was at a significant disadvantage when it came to challenging the development assessment. But while the regime was already tilted in favour of the proponents, the multiple policy changes brought about in the wake of the appeal, uh, combined with the various discursive tactics that were employed by the company, served to totally disempower the community. So ultimately what this case illustrates that in some cases the existence of opportunities for participation does not necessarily translate into effective participation due to financial, technical and most importantly structural barriers that impair the quality of community input. So what can we do to overcome some of these factors? And I won't speak to this in, in too much detail because I am running out of time and a number of other speakers have already addressed some of these concepts over the last day and a half. To overcome perceptions of injustice and minimise conflict, it's fundamental that decision makers understand how participation can be impaired and remedy those constraints. We know that we need to enhance conditions for participation, clear and early notice of, of uh, issues requiring decisions, providing the relevant information in a way that is easy to understand, having multi-directional consultation and meaningful input into decision making. Financial, technical and other structural barriers participation need to be attended to. Longer time needs to be allowed for submissions. Technical data needs to be provided in a form that is easy to digest and make sense of. And the financial costs of participation need to be recognised and offset. Policy and regulatory requirements to consult stakeholders should be examined. They need to detail how participation will occur, but most importantly, how those inputs are going to be used in practice. There needs to be a requirement to assess the effectiveness of participatory opportunities, because without that monitoring and evaluation, decision makers may hear, but not necessarily listen to, public views. We know that broad review functions are necessary and judicial review of public consultation processes can provide a safeguard against tokenism. And finally, when it comes to assessment, the privileging of expert scientific evidence and the limited opportunities to raise place-based concerns is something that also needs to be confronted. We know that where citizens and uh, groups do not have the ability to raise these sorts of concerns, it erodes their connection to place and their ability to meaningfully participate. Concepts such as expanded social impact assessment can sit alongside environmental and economic impact assessments when it comes to development assessment processes. Coming back to where I started, the emerging environmental justice narrative across cases of land use conflict in Australia has provided a vocabulary for communities to articulate social and environmental issues. By using this more expanded concept of environmental justice that moves beyond the distributional frame, uh, communities have been able to identify barriers to justice and have a platform to articulate broader concerns around environmental decision making and also have an opportunity to connect with a wider movement which adds weight to claims and also assists in agitating for reform. Just on my final slide, there's contact details if you would like to follow up about anything and uh, also uh, a recent publication that I've had uh, published through um, EarthScan which details the Bolga case study as well as a number of other case studies both in Australia and the United States dealing with environmental justice. Thank you very much. Agradecemos muy sinceramente la exposición de la profesora Kenny en este interesante tema. Quisiera recordarles que Professor Kennedy in this interesting
questions to any of our speakers, and they will be read after the last presentation. Now, I have to introduce Mr. Ángel Ruiz de Apodaca Espinosa. He holds a degree on law from Dulce University. He also has a master's in environment from the University of País Vasco, and also from he currently works as an administrative law from University of Navarra, working on environmental law in the sectors of information, water, waste, and he is also the author of several publications, and he has collaborated in the creation of regulation texts with several public entities. Currently, Professor Rees presents the work, The Access to Environmental Justice in Spain and in the European Union after 20 years after the Aarhus Agreement. First of all, I would like to thank the Environmental Court of Santiago for inviting me to participate in this international forum once again, and specifically to Chief Justice Minister Alejandro Ruiz Fabres. The RS agreement was mentioned this morning, and I will talk about the third pillar. Information, participation, and access to justice are the three pillars of environmental democracy. Information and participation are always related, because without information, it is very hard to participate properly in all these decision-making processes or even regulating processes with the administrations running them. Now, the guarantee to, uh, for complying these rights of information and participation and also environmental legislation, which is very demanding, wouldn't be of use if the possibility to access justice weren't, weren't demanded given any administrative resolution that could go over the rights of information or participation or the compliance of environmental legislation. The balance between this and the guarantees given to citizens find their absolute guarantee in the possibility of citizens going before the court any times their rights are violated or when the environmental legislation is violated because the purpose is to protect the environment. And this is a collective interest, an in, a right that affects other fundamental rights, the right to life, physical integrity, health, of uh, intimacy without violating the domicile, and the rights for third generations, for future generations. And that is what sustainable development consists of and why we are here today considering that in 30 years I won't be here and several of those attending this forum won't be here either. But we need to look out for future generations. Therefore, we must demand public administrators and powers to comply with their obligation to protect natural resources, provide information, promote participation in the decision-making process, and also comply with the environmental legislation and then be subject to the possible judicial actions that citizens may require when they understand that these obligations haven't been fulfilled. So it has been 20 years from the ARIS agreement, and I must say that from the point of view of the European Union, and specifically from the point of view of Spain, things haven't changed much. The European Union still hasn't passed a community regulation or directive that regulates the access to environmental justice, but it has, does it, it has done it with participation and information. And in Spain, we have the law of participation, information, and access to justice, which is known as the RS um, agreement. It is uh, an agreement from 1998, and as the from the Rio Declaration that comes to reclaim the three pillars for environmental democracy. The ninth article of the agreement 
talks about the third pillar, the need to, of access to environmental justice when the right of information is violated and also the right for participation is violated. And it shows the people that should be provided with the access and resources and the general public, which is the rest of us, even if we do not have a legitimate interest in it. In the same way, the ARIS agreement refers to the obstacles to not have a prohibitive cost, and I will talk about this at the end of my presentation. The Escasu agreement that I have read in detail, and from this year, March 4th, 2018, is of course an agreement seems more demanding and specifically on Article 8 of the Escasu Agreement. Both have to do with the internal legislation of the signing parties. However, it uses the ARUS Agreement says protect. However, the Escasu uses the words will ensure it accesses it guarantees the right of access in a series of circumstances with effective processes in a timely manner without any excessive costs to facilitate the access to justice. And it also uses the word will establish. So in my opinion, apart from it being more detailed and due to the language used, it seems to be more demanding. And I was saying that Chile, despite the fact of being one of the promoters of the Escasu agreement together with Costa Rica, hasn't signed it yet because probably if this agreement is signed, it must be fulfilled. And maybe it is too difficult and it has very strict guidelines. And it seems that hard law becomes soft law and the states apply it to its own benefit. So let's talk about the European Union. As you know, it is 27, it used to be 28 before the Brexit. And as I was telling you, the European Union has a very important community environmental policy that affects the rest of the policies. It has defended the environment, it has engaged in more ambitious commitments such as the climate change. And it developed through directives the right to environmental information and the right for participation. However, the access to justice hasn't been developed, despite the fact that in 2003 there was a, a community uh, proposal directive in the sense that states should recognize the legitimation of these rules given the violation of any of the rights. However, this proposal wasn't approved and the European Union has not chosen to adapt it. And why? Due to a communication from the European Commission regarding the access of justice from 28 April 2017, and it is not a standard, it is just a guideline document. However, I recommend you to read it because the European Commission provides a guideline document for judges in the judicial courts in Europe to stop them stating any harmful statements and it is also directed to European public administrators and also citizens and NGOs if they want to exert their right to access justice in environmental issues and in case they have any doubts in terms of costs, legitimation or the reasons that could lead them to ask for the help of judges and courts. Some actors say that, there, that the European Union hasn't been able to reach an agreement to establish a mandatory juridical um, norm that forces all the member states to apply this. It is true that the jurisprudence of the Luxembourg Tribunal 
has been interpreting the RS agreement in the harmful issues that national tribunals have been stating. Cristina Olsen was sentencing in the justice tribunal that where it said that the Swedish standard was contrary to the spirit of Eris and there was a recent sentence of the justice course of 2017 also establishes that the Austrian standard is not compatible with the Aris agreement in terms of water because it didn't allow an authorization to an environmental NGO and it wasn't opposed to its eventual access to justice. Now let me talk about the situation in Spain. The ways to access the defense of the environment are several. First of all, it is through the criminal way. This is the crimes against the environment are um, made by uh, individuals, also crimes against flora and fauna, and also um, there were there are situations where the public administrations has authorized uh, projects that shouldn't have been approved because of environmental rights. Frequently, since 1983, after a constitutional mandate, environmental crimes are specified. And since then, we have a code on these crimes. It is a blank standard with which the judge needs to manage the environmental legislation. And it is also an abstract danger standard. This is, there isn't the result in terms of the danger to the environment because it only demands to have put the natural resources in risk. And it can, and the sentence can be of up to five years. The civil way is the ordinary jurisdiction. This has to do with fumes, smells, odors, and this forces the causer to stop the emissions that lead to these problems, and in that case, provide indemnifications. This is not considered in the Spanish law as a fundamental law. However, the constitutional tribunal has studied this because it affects other fundamental rights, such as the right to life, physical integrity, or intimacy, and not violating the domicile, which is not only vulnerated when an agent kicks the door from our house, but when we have to withstand emissions that affect our own health. If we're not satisfied through the ordinary means, we cannot go to Luxembourg. We can go to Strasbourg, to the Human Rights Tribunal that uses the Human Rights um, Rome Agreement that did not consider the right to an environment, but that has been acknowledging based on Article 8 that proclaims the right to intimacy, the, these rights in Spain we have been condemned due to the violation of this article. Two of them have to do with acoustic contamination, the right to rest, the right to not withstand unbearable acoustic emissions. And this was also due to something that happened in 1994, where a depurator was built next to an old lady's house. And then one situation taking place with noises in Valencia. And in 2018, where there was a sentence due to the that due to the inactivity of the municipality of Valencia, there was a citizen withstanding unbearable 
noise levels. We, it is very usual for NGOs giving an incompliance or a breach with the European regulations present a claim before the European Commission, which protects the community right and the environmental um, community right is common for all the 27 states. And they may require information to the violating state. And if it is not satisfactory, they can go before the tribunals. A recent sentence in the uh, Justice Tribunal from October 2018, the United Kingdom is sentenced before it leaves. In this case, because an NGO reported the the UK for not dis, not assigning all the conservation areas of a certain species that existed in the UK, and the Justice Tribunal acknowledges that and sentences the UK. Now I will talk about putting the jurisdictional case. Logically, who is held liable of complying with the environmental law? I said this two years ago that environmental law is administrative because you do not oblige public administration to follow environmental law with authorizations inspecting with sanctions, acting in a positive way, helping restore. And generally, if we do not agree, first of all, we will have to go through the path of administrative law. As I was told this morning, it has very little chances of success. So therefore, we have to go through the judicial contentious administrative pathway. And I'm well aware that it does not exist due to the, the fact that there are no specialized environment and there are no specialized tribunals therefore it's under the responsibility of the environmental tribunal how has this taken place in spain well it's highly conditioned if there is a case related to the administration there has to be a legitimate interest that may be affected directly or indirectly by the administrative decision. There's also legitimacy for the NGOs that follow a series of requirements. Many authors requested public action. I sincerely think that public action is not necessary. I'll say why. The Spanish regulation is enough because by knowing what has been created in order to defend the NGOs, it's enough because it's not necessary for them to ensure the rule of law as they are a minority. But the contentious administrative law in Article 1901, this has been interpreted in a very broad sense on behalf of judges and courtrooms. Maybe it wouldn't have been necessary and therefore to hold public action. We must not be drifted away. As we said this morning, the environment does not have anyone being an advocate for it. It costs money and time. Therefore, who, who is not in charge, they will set forth a legal case. It's the rights of participation. Who claims information? Who requests environmental information? What do we require? In, require? to present these complaints. The citizens on the street? No. Those who have their interests affected, the stakeholders or the groups of interest going through the citizens that are nearby neighbors of the extractive industry. And that is where we see that acronym that always flourishes. I've created my own Spanish acronym, the NIMBY effect. It's yes, but not here. It's elsewhere. Because if not, the environment can interest us very little. Therefore, to acknowledge a public action would not have increased legitimacy or its legal standing because whoever is involved in this issue, it 
is related to an economic cost. So what are the requirements of the Spanish leg legislation? It's not all the NGOs. Firstly, we demand that according to the bylaws, these NGOs have their goals and to protect the environment. Secondly, for them to be built with at least two years since established. With that, we avoid the ad hoc creation of determined NGOs that try to stop a determined project. Thirdly, to have its territorial land approach according to the plan administrative act that it's trying to go through. This last requirement is a sort of illusion. I don't know what the legislator was thinking of because the international ideals as Greenpeace, Ecologists in Action, or others have a national scale performance when they are international. That is one requirement that is easily compliable with on behalf of those who present a complaint. It's also to demand the compliance of environmental law. There is a sentence that was quite curious. It was related to mining companies. There's an NGO called the Non-Gold Platform. And it's against the extractive activities in general. It denies legitimacy for one reason. Your goal is environmental protection, but you are recurring to mining uh, concessions. That's not an environmental right. The one that regulates the environmental rights is far from this. And therefore, they say, I apologize, but you cannot present a complaint and there is no legitimacy in this regard. I don't want to bore you furthermore with what has taken place in Spain. There were very interesting sentences. It's the sentence of July 7th, San Fermin, in 2017. And I say so because this is a sentence for those who are curious, the Supreme Court of Spain. And you can have access to the web page under which we interpret in a vast way the legal standing. It's legal standing of the uh, foundation called uh, Oceana and to be able to stop the sanction that is to be decided. Legal standing is denied and then we use Article 45 of the Constitution and making reference to everything that I've mentioned, the existence of fussy interests, environmental protection, and that its purpose is no other than to protect something so important and in concrete a sanction process. It's a ship that dumps hydrocarbons into the sea. There are two sl small benchmarks. Spain is a state under which we uh, seek measure that establish the basic autonomous communities that have a stand in legitimate activities. Many of those who have a legis legitimate standing have gone beyond public action as a general one to jurisdictional parties without the need of crediting an interest to face decisions or actions. Of course, this implies that in autonomous communities have uh, public actions and others don't. Some have distinguished them in the administrative action in judicial terms. And we have a very recent sentence of the Spanish Constitutional Court that solves a lack of constitutionality against the housing project in which the Constitutional Court is following on the procedural law in access to communities the autonomous com communities do not have. Well. We might not be able to go to trials in identical issues. In administrative ones, the autonomous communities may acknowledge public action. Therefore, anyone can present in administrative terms against the administration if it's estimated by the autonomous community without the need of a legitimate, uh, legitimate standing. How is it possible to, res uh, to present a hierarchical 
recourse, and it's admitted due to lack of legal standing. And these are one of the perversions that, from my viewpoint, has taken place with these sentences. Then we have singular laws, as you will may know. Well, no, it's a concrete case in Spain. We have gone to some autonomous communities to avoid the participation in the decision-making process. There is one uh, bill that is to set forth the possibility to uh, present them, because if not, there would be an, an constitutional recourse the deputies, the advocates, the ombudsman, and we would save the participation. We would provide relative information, which is the legislative one, and we avoid any sort of uh, resource. And the Spanish uh, court has presented itself, it has appeared before, and the Justice Tribunal of the European Union clearly said that the singular laws in environmental projects are not admissible if we try to elude Article 3.9 of the AHAS agreement, the possibility to have access to justice. In five minutes, I will finish my presentation. The procedures have to be fast without the cost being way too high. It's something that is stated in the Arhes Convention. I have said it costs money and time. There are many hurdles. The first one is quite clear. It's the economic cost. The economic cost that has been portrayed by the need of a lawyer, procurement, and obviously all the other issues entailed. There's also a contentious administrative issue because the law establishes if we do not see the intentions of the person, person presenting the lawsuit, this is an element that is dissuasive that, from my viewpoint, should have a nuance, though there have been some sentences that have provided their nuance due to the complexity of the matter by speaking of regulations, it has not approached the NGOs, and it hasn't gone beyond 3,000 euros, which is not an excessive amount. Secondly, free access to justice. It's quite funny. The NGOs say that having an action will have the right to free justice, but the Spanish law 196 of access to free justice does not include it. And we have had the resolution of different bars of attorneys. They haven't shown that they lack resources to set forth a lawsuit. It's not only en enough to be good, but you need to present them. Then we have remedial measures. We have spoken of Indubio Pro Natura. As you know, remedial measures, remedial justice ensures effectiveness of the sentence to be dictaminated. These processes are always involved in the demand or overlapping, suspending the act or resolution, which will be involved in extractive activities when there's a favorable decision the mine company is already under its activity. Here we have a very three important criteria, pericrum in mora, and secondly, to overweigh the interest in conflict, the, the public environmental one should prevail. Do not forget that public administration adopts decisions based on a previous process based on previous participation with a driven resolution, environmental impact assessments, and they also have the presumption of legality. And when they go through the remedial measure, except if the administrative measure does not look good, and we have the funos, no duties, 
and therefore there are conditions under what and uh, under which it might flourish. Uh, I apologize. We are going to argument economic, public, social interests that entail us to the exercise of the activity requested. Because we presume, though it's a juristantum presumption, it complies with the general interest, and therefore that project has been approved of prior the environmental impact assessment, guaranteeing the participation. It's the ideal case scenario. If it's not the case, tough luck. And the minister, Minister Munoz, mentioned the execution of sentences. One minute left and I'll finish. We might have a sentence and what will the purpose be? Because you well know that effective judicial sentences is not only based on a judicial resolution. If we have a favorable sentence, this has to be executed. In Spain, more or less 25% of the contentious administrative sentences are not executed due to a material impossibility you're not going to raise a high a highway to see how you get rid of a gap that the mining sector left and there is also an a legal uh, breach because we have not applied the sentence. I don't know if you've been in Spain, you might have landed in the Adolfo Suarez airport and there's a firm sentence on behalf of the Supreme Court that obliged to drop in 30% the operations of landing and taking off in the Madrid Barajas airport based on a remedial measure presented by a group of neighbors that could not stand the noises entailed by the airport in the year 2000. And day to day, the sentence is not executed under its own terms. The sentences of demolitions are many. The execution, very few. Well, I'm on time, and I think the access to environmental justice is beautiful, interesting, but as I was saying, let's not be deceived. We might recognize a public action, but it's evident that the person exercising or the company is the one who's always been able to do so because, uh, as I've said, I don't want to be pessimistic. Defending the environment implies money and time. Many thanks to the Environmental Tribunal of Santiago and the Chief Justice, and I'm at your will. Thank you. We would like to thank Professor Ruiz de Podaca for his excellent presentation. Now, given time and thanking all the questions made to the speakers, we will choose one for each. For Professor Esteves Pardo, we would like to ask, how should the re how should risk be weighed for precautionary measures? from courts. Well, that's the main topic, weighing risk evaluation is something that is recognized in the um, uh, as risk assessment. But what I would like to highlight here has to do with these two components, a scientific and a scientific component and a legal component. In general terms, I think that an excessive protagonism has been given to scientific um, valuations and it comes from the time in which uh, the um, judges discovered science where law was used based on scientific facts and we're still amazed by science and 
It has to do with something else. For instance, I do not believe that a person can be assigned responsibility due to decisions adopted in uncertainty situations or we shouldn't have the same valuation criteria. We should have to look for a new figure that weren't exactly responsibility. I think that there must be a circuit or we can build this around the theory of legal situation in uncertainty moments. Before I talked about presumptions, presumptions are coming back and one of the scopes or areas in which they are being developed in Europe, for instance, is the environmental cases. There are situations of uncertainty in terms of who caused this contamination episode or who caused this harm. And in the European legislation, it is said that in these cases, it is presumed that the company developing a, an activity to produce it is presumed to be the cost. So it is a decision mechanism around um, scientific determinations. But there is a counter presumption system as well. This is the, per the company that incurs in this presumption has a way to escape from it. For that presumption not to be against it if it sticks to a certain auditing regime. Therefore, I think that a circuit is established in terms of legal references, procedural references, and of course, that does not exclude the technical intervention. However, I think that we shouldn't be looking for that scientific certainty that many times are practically impossible to find. Thank you, Professor. For Professor Amanda Kennedy. How can courts promote solutions to problems of environment? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's an interesting one in light of the cases that I spoke about, or the case, the Bulga case that I spoke about, because it reveals that in some circumstances, there's actually very little that a court can do by the time a case comes to it uh, around matters of environmental justice. And so I think uh, certainly in, um, in the Australian context where there's been much criticism of the judiciary and uh, how it has brought to life principles sustainable development, uh, there is actually a need to first of all recognise the constraints on the judiciary um, to give life to those principles if the matters are either not coming before the court or if, as was the case in the Bulga decision, uh, the, the determination of the court is uh, turned over the very next day uh, by legislative change. So in terms of looking at how the courts can promote solutions, I think keeping an open mind around things like uh, an expanded social impact assessment, following on from uh, the comments of uh, Professor Pardo here, around uh, looking beyond uh, this, this uh, I think the term from the uh, translator was the excessive protagonism for science, keeping an open mind about uh, what, what we know in, uh, colloquially as the soft science, uh, looking at uh, concepts from psychology and, and human behaviour and bringing that in and, and keeping an open mind about that in determinations. We saw that with Chief Justice Preston in the Bulga case with this concept of solastalgia, a very novel concept, one that hadn't been academically tested and one which uh, perhaps another judge may have uh, excluded straight away. But I think keeping that open mind about these new concepts and allowing uh, members of the public to use their own language and their own terms to bring their concerns before uh, tribunals and decision-making bodies uh, helps to promote access to justice. Uh, I think that's probably the predominant way. Uh, also being patient with some of these structural limitations and recognising that in many cases there's very little that a community or individuals can do 
uh, in order to understand and digest some of that very technical information. Thank you, Professor. And the last question is for Professor Rhys de Apodaca. What is your opinion on the Escazú's agreement regarding in comparison with the ORIS agreement? Well, my opinion, and I have said this before, I think that it is extraordinary. It is an agreement that is basically the twin brother of the ARIS uh, agreement of 1998. The standards, well, I have always said that legislating is easy. The actual proof of a legal standard is its application. And of course, we must take care of not creating a standard that will not be applied. I believe that it is a very demanding agreement. And if we compare it with the ARIS and the Escazú agreement 20 years later, my opinion is that it is far more demanding and strict. And this is also in terms of information. The obligations for providing environmental information are very similar to an internal legislation of a state, more than an agreement. And it provides more detail in justice. It doesn't make any distinctions between the general public or others. It refers to vulnerable groups. We talked this morning about vulnerability, which is very important. And the verbs that it uses are, are verbs that require the state to do things. It uses a co an international coercion instrument so that states have to comply with it. I um, used to see it with environmental law, international environmental law, and many states do not comply with them. It all depends on the will and all the signatory states, as it has happened last month in New York, for them to incorporate it into their internal regulation. From my point of view, if a state ratifies and signs an international agreement, then it can be used by citizens. I, that's my opinion, at least. Thank you very much, Professor. To finish, I would like to thank you for coming to Chile, for giving us such great presentations to Professors Jose Pardo, Amanda Kennedy, and Luis de Polo. Please, let's give them a warm round of applause. We would like to thank the presentations of our distinguished academicians. And now we would like to invite you to the closing ceremony for the Third International Forum on Environmental Justice, organized by the um, Environmental Court of Santiago. Our next speaker was Minister and Chief Justice of the Santiago Environmental Court between 12, 2012 and 2014. In 2015, he was appointed as the Minister of the Supreme Court. He led studies of the Supreme Court of Justice between 2006 and 2012. He is an attorney from the University of Chile. He also holds a degree from the same, uh, a master's degree from the same university. He also works as a constitutional law professor in the School of Law of Universidad de Chile. And he has a vast trajectory as a professor in public law in constitutional, urbanistic, environmental, and political science aspects in several universities. We would like to give the floor to the Minister of the Constitutional Tribunal, Mr. Jose Ignacio Vázquez Márquez. Let's see how we can keep this in place. 
Good afternoon to the judges, judges, attorneys, academicians, and everyone attending this international forum. Having participated and organized the first version of it in 2014 as the Chief Justice of the Environmental Court of Santiago, I would like to thank the organizers of this forum and I am delighted to express some ideas in the closing ceremony. I will center in two aspects of protection of environmental law. I use, I'm talking about the rule of law and judges. As we know, the appearance of the state in, mo in the modern age came through several powers, pol uh, from politics to cultural, and many times it took place through legal standards. From the absolutism state until it consolidated with the mechanism of rule of law, which is currently a constitutional state. The essence of this last stage in the state development is contained in Article 16 of the Declaration of Men and Citizens of 1789 that says that if in a society the separation of roles and if rights are not guaranteed, then there is no constitution. Both the French and the American Revolution appear as the moments that are a basis for the constitutional state. However, its development in Europe led soon to a limited form that has been denominated as a legislative state or a legal law state. This went from the power of the people to whom would assume the representation. This is the legislator that has only linked forms and procedures, but not the content or the objectives, and that would be imposing its will as law. The result would be um, juridical positivism and for judges the compliance of law according to it. While the Constitution worked only as a formal title for legitimation of democratic power, it was only a piece of paper with good intentions, a decoration in the front of democracy that did not impede excesses and fraud that only served to disguise the government of mankind and that was assumed as legible salutus. As I was saying, it was not only until the Second World War in the 20th century after the tragedy taking place at that moment, a change in the political and constitutional paradigm would take place with the new European constitutions. At that moment, the constitution acquires the a range of fundamental norm with a content of fundamental rights of principles and values becoming the source of sources for legal aspects. In this new constitutional paradigm, we have the so-called rematerialization of the Constitution that leads to other constitutions where, which are procedural or formal that limited to apply discipline within the states to some constitutions that are full of material content. La prevención de Benjamin Constant. Es el advenimiento del Estado Constitucional de Derecho, ese mismo que se anunciaba en la Declaración de Derechos de 1789 que mencionaba anteriormente y que se reflejaba en el artículo 16 del mismo. Respecto del amplio dominio que mantuvieron durante todo el siglo XIX el pensamiento jurídico positivista o normativista en la ciencia, la dogmática, la jurisprudencia, restringido a la ley, los códigos y el Estado legal de derecho, serán fuertemente desafiados a partir de este momento y limitados, tanto por la experiencia histórica de vaciamiento de contenido jurídico y ético y sus nefastos resultados políticos, 
como por el constitucionalismo contemporáneo y sus frutos, el Estado constitucional y la constitución material, llena de principios, valores y derechos fundamentales. Pero más allá de la transformación respecto de la jerarquía de las fuentes del derecho, es la importancia que adquieren los derechos fundamentales y los principios constitucionales frente a los cuales a la ley solo le queda desarrollarlos cuando exista reserva legal y respetar su contenido esencial como si este fuera un coto dado para el legislador. En este nuevo paradigma de Estado, las normas legales deben someterse tanto a las reglas formales sobre producción como, aquellos, como aquellas sustanciales sobre su contenido. Por su parte, la función jurisdiccional adquiere una autonomía y unos rasgos funcionales a esta forma de Estado, desarrollándose mayores controles no solo respecto al cumplimiento de la legalidad, sino principalmente al principio de supremacía constitucional. La propia jurisdicción ordinaria... This is towards the liberation under which the legislator faced in applying law. We speak of the doctrine of a judicial creation of law, and we hear a prophecy of Oscar Vilo pronounced in 1985, law and architecture creating created for the people it guarantees essentially the functional rights in the state the functional state will see further ahead the demands for these roles to be developed legitimate in legitimate terms the role of the judge our state our country adopted the paradigm with the constitution of 1980 and has improved progressively in 30 years' time. Its dogmatic content based on fundamental law improved considerably, and the guarantee of the same was enriched with different actions or constitutional remedies and providing further development for a due process. Regarding the protection of the environment in our country, it has been possible Due to the development of the constitutional state, it was provided the fundamental right of the third generation by living in an environment free of pollution. And what will be more effective is to establish the right to preserve the environmental heritage in Article 19, uh, Clause 8. There is the protection on the one hand and the duty on the other. The text of the Constitution to live in the environment free of pollution was in Article 19 that points out the right to live in a free of pollution environment. It's the duty of the state to safeguard that it is not affected and also to beware of what occurs with nature. It's not only a right but also a duty. And then it adds something that was present in Minister or Justice Antonio Benjamin. The law will establish specific restrictions to the to exercising rights or freedoms in the environment. And we have discussed that it might be subjective or social. In the first case, we would acknowledge a natural person and the exercise would be translated in legal terms into the powers of doing or giving and in practice and based on its rights, it would not be efficient enough. Notwithstanding, in current terms and based on the jurisprudence and the legal standing of the on the environment in, uh, on the legal on the environmental courts we have to protect a common heritage a lively a crucial not only for the well-being of individuals but all the national community with the larger development of awareness with the ecological crisis and its risks is understood in a global landscape i will now continue with as we know, we are, have integrated different elements that act upon itself, the territory, land, sovereignty, and the social and cultural has the protection of the land and its people with any threat 
within or without, which is necessary for a society. That's what Arturo Benz, a, a German, and we must see implicitly protected the environment because prior to and beyond understanding the environment just as a subjective social universal right, it is necessary to acknowledge a collective asset as it is nature in itself. As it is being mentioned, as it has been mentioned by Ms. Mr. Mateo, this is an individualistic substratum that is collective and wishes to protect mankind. It is for this reason, as we, as we have mentioned, state protection. The environment is a collective asset. As for the state, the territory is an essential. So, the, so what has been announced in terms of binding this is not related to a free of pollution environment. It might seem a bit wacky due to the, the fact that law is fully related, but safeguarding the preservation and safeguarding nature is a mandate that is way more effective and it is a common asset that we cannot leave aside. Therefore, it's a way of guaranteeing the rights, essential rights in terms of duties. With the current doctrine, when we speak of rights as specific, therefore, the fact of living in a free of pollution environment not only authorizes the legislator to establish specific restrictions in exercising specific rights and freedoms, but also to preserve the environmental asset is one of the expressed causes to deprive us from the environment that it must comply with. It's what Justice Benjamin denominated the ecological function or environmental function in our Constitution. We must highlight that the basis of laws in the environment establishes the constitutional legislation in the environment in a broader sense in terms of the life quality of the population and the social cultural elements. On the other hand, the Constitution not only included the fundamental rights, but it, there's also a procedural mechanism in the case that it is affected due to legal lack of representation. There's a remedial recourse, for instance, that confirms its protective efficacy. The jurisprudence in our uh, courtrooms in the last decades have interpreted in the sense that we characterize the constitutional rights have assumed progressively with further decision the protection of the environment. In this regard, the protection and the court of the environment in one of these sentences can interpret the doctrine in the following way, dictaminating an emissions regulation or a prevention plan to depollute the organs of the state must surveil, must ensure that a free of pollution environment is not to be affected. The duty of protection also when speaking of fishing, it has highlighted this uh, protection measure. When we authorize no more fishing, it obeys to what is imposed at the state to safeguard nature. In another decision, the Constitutional Tribunal has said that the environment is a constitutional asset from Article 19, Number 8 of the Constitution. This is an autonomous right guided to protect the jurisdictional asset under which the environment lays upon to defend the constitutional rights. On the other hand, the Constitution also enshrines the social protection. Article 19, number 24, the liability to hold obligations and limitations that 
are triggered by this concept, social protection that established the right of property as a duty. And in terms of waters, number eight of bylaw 19, which is the duty of the state that a free of pollution environment is not to be affected. It is also expanded upon number 24 that we have just pointed out, understanding that the social function of property is to preserve the environment. And in a recent sentence of this year, uh, based on a requirement uh, of not being able to apply this to to a historical issue, which was the the wool, a very specific line of wool, it attempted against the social cultural heritage. Therefore, in this regard, we must highlight that the fact of living in a free of pollution environment started from the year 1990s due to a environmental a public regulation and also in jurisdictional terms. So when we have spoken or when we mention a rule of law, an environmental rule of law, we may state that in our country we have set forth in institutional terms, we have created a sort of environmental rule of law or in concrete terms what is respected throughout these different Forms. And secondly, when we speak of judges, the protection of the environment requires execution, uh, lawyers, and also the jurisdictional standing. And when solving as possible environmental justice, Montesquieu expressed that judges were no further than people who pronounced by its mouth what law decides. It's an illusion that does not correspond or correlate in our days to what occurs. No one can deny that these days that the judge has a great deal of discretion when applying uh, law as a consequence. Among other factors, it's source systems that are way more complex and disperse, increasing production of all sorts of regulations and a large part of what comprises our legal system, in effect, leaves a judge under larger uh, freedom. And we are facing a phenomenon of a judicial creation of law. Some have denied this in the doctrine, but we will see where this aims. Currently, judges are not limited to apply this in a mechanic, a neutral way in which the largest premise is a, an abstract jurisdictional one, and finally a result, which is the facts and a sentence. As a consequence, judges have reached these days a great deal of protagonism, which, of course, is something that is the purpose of, pos of the, this positivism and the judge, in light of legigus salutus, the legislator, but beware, this sum, there's a trend, there's a margin or room for these judges in which protagonism is transformed into the um, main characters, and that's a risk. It sets them at stake. Not only it's in its creation as a consequence of law, not having answers for all the cases, and it will be the one enforcing law who solves this in material terms, though discretion will not always be in hand with being discreet. This protagonism of the justice has increased throughout the 20th century. In effect, the European jurisdictional science and the constitutionalism conceived it as a regulation of the way of power as a consequence based on competencies and procedures. And nowadays, facing the new constitutionalism 
and the new state, we are in a legal system comprised by other elements, other sources, other formal sources of law. Here I wish to divide an issue. This is uh, one that we have faced in the forum, which is related to principles. Regulations, as many authors have defined them, these are rules and principles with the constitutionalization and the end of pro-positivism. The legal system is way more complicated when applying these principles and the procedural aspects are expressed throughout uh, norm uh, throughout uh, regulations that are called principles. Going through one of the main exposers of law, Robert Alexis, they are not far from being regulators. Therefore, we have to continue a moral pathway between distinguishes, uh, distinguishing the rules and principles we comply with or not. And secondly, we have an optimization of the mandate. And there are different uh, possibilities, de facto possibilities. And these would be effective based on the jurist or the judge to transform them into valid uh, regulations, but having a gradual compliance. On the other hand, a large jurist, Luis Prieto Sanchez, expresses that principles have two regulation uh, aspects. What's most important is that there are two principles, the explicit ones that appear in a regulation, and they appear in a concrete regulatory procedure and the validity of the standards. And there, the regulating character of this, these principles seems unquestionable because they come from a consolidated tree called the Constitution. Secondly, we have implicit principles that are criteria that come from an inductive or deductive path of regulating provisions and it will depend on the number of sti of uh, norms obtained and these would be imperative either directly or indirectly its prescriptive sense appears under the incorporation of a law or a sentence although many times they establish direct obligations therefore explicit and implicit principles shouldn't have a problem in terms in terms of their application validity and validity. Finally, extra systemical principles are distinguished, those that cannot be placed in previous categories and that will have a legal character when they come from a norm or a principle rooted in this. I'm bringing this up due to this continuous statement of principles in terms of environmental law. Yesterday, a long content of principles was displayed. Many of those principles are implicit, others will be explicit. But what happens with that other universe of principles? Where do they come from? What happens to them? When I ask where they come from, some may come from the hard law, from treaties and international agreements or conventions, and the others come from soft law. This, thing's that, this thing that for some authors is interpreted in that way. We need to keep this into account because Judges are not simply here to extract principles or to take principles from a magical hat, but to apply law. In the resolution of environmental affairs, 
when applying the principles, it doesn't mean to take anything from anywhere as an ideological statement without any rationality and applied in the margin of proportionality criteria, what we would call, using a recurrent term, actual arms that are used. This is a problem that we must take into account. This is not as free or discretional as we may think because being subject to law is the judge is not impartial and it cannot judge in this way and no judges can elude arguments or the rationality both for rules and principles. So when solving conflicts between legal principles, there is no single answer. However, the rationalization and justification process allows for that decision to be legitimate, as it has been pointed out by Andres Ibáñez. The administration of justice is the function of guaranteeing fundamental rights, and it must be exerted by a judge satisfying two things. One, the represented one called the truth of the facts, where we couldn't think about a fair decision, and the other one that is solved under an actual application of legality. That is why we motivate the resolution of both perspectives and it must be properly addressed so that the sentence has the necessary legitimacy. And with this, I would like to close the topic of principles. Now let's continue with judges in this virtue that I would call the sovereign virtue of judges judicial independence, which is vital for environmental justice. This requires the existence of independent judges that can act in an impartial way and apply law in a reasonable manner. When I talk about independence, I'm not talking exclusively about the independence for an external person. I'm talking about that personal independence that can lead the judge through the path of impartiality. As I was saying, justice is a cardinal virtue, but it can only be attained through law, through a legal system that can interpret, apply it, and enforce it based on that sovereign virtue, which is independence, solve issues with justice criteria, without influences, without um, imbalances, can only be exerted if the judge is free of dependence, criteria, and influences that are out of the legal scope. In consequence, then, the judges can act with authority, but which kind of judges can do this? I will not go into a classic definition of François that states a distinction between Judge Jupiter, faithful to law and the pyramid, or Judge Hercules, who is a semi-god, or Judge Hermes, who is the interpreter and creator of law relating different sources. I will leave that pending because it is not applicable to what I want to refer to. It is said that an independent judge is not influenced by or controlled by anyone. Let's see the level of independence required by judges. The first requirement is for ju judge to be independent from the parts under the conflict or litigation, what we would call impartiality. And no concessions should be taken that could affect that value. The judge judges from a position in which it is not a party. And this is important in terms of principles. Judges are not a party. They act as a third party, necessarily. And that is a sine qua non condition to, and 
the decision will have irreversible consequences for the parties and the establishment of a social and legal aspect rebalancing order. Then we have jurisdictional economy, what we have regarding other judges. Certainly, the ones in the higher courts exert control over others. These traditional tra uh, forms of control among colleagues do not threaten the independence that judges should have. This control from the higher judges is legitimate, and it is not absolute accepted accordance to the correct application of the law. These the attribution to correct other judges through a resources system is acceptable. A third dimension of independence has to do with political isolation. This requires judges to be independent from political institutions and from public opinion, and especially from what is in the media. Currently, this is very important and very difficult to comply with. This is due to social media, for instance, where there is an ongoing connection of people and judges are not free of that. The need for judges to be politically isolated comes from the nature of the legal function and for judges to decide what is fair, not to adopt this through a public policy or what is wished by people. That is not the function of judges. Looking for justice depends on listening to arguments and provide the necessary justifications that must be free of any kind of political and social influence. The farther they are from the political and social noise, judges can decide what is fair and not what is politically adequate or correct. And understanding that this is one of the cardinal virtues virtues of the judicial power. Too much, it is also known that too much independence can be negative. A fourth dimension of independence that many times is not present, is not considered, that is difficult to assume and requires a strong dose of personal activity. That is the independent the independence with oneself, the independence from our own beliefs of our personal interests as well. To be truly independent, a judge needs to apply the rules of law, and for that, it needs to be independent from themselves. Justice is blind for the power, in terms of the powerful, for, but also from the personal beliefs of those in charge of judging. The judge must step away from its own defects and hate or convictions. It is said, Sinaida, it, is, it must break away from them, and for that, they need a great dose of um, humbleness. Otherwise, they will proceed in an unfair matter. Being impartial and independent requires to be necessarily motivated by the ambition of respecting the directives imposed by the rules of the community. Impartiality, and I know that I am short of time. Impartiality includes the independence of oneself, and that is the sovereign judicial virtue. Understanding it in this way will help us to see clearly what is the criteria that societies have for judging what we do, but it also has a direct impact on the way in which we understand the judicial function. I will have to leave out some parts of my speech due to time constraints. And today I read an interesting book from philosopher Mal Martha Eusbang. It's called Poetic Justice.
and it mentioned and identified a poet as a judge or a judge as a poet in very simple terms based on the reflections of poet John Whitman after the American Civil War. She affirmed the need to have poets in the public life of the nation. And the following was mentioned. There must be poets, judges, as equal men, not within it, but outside of it, because outside of it, things are grotesque, eccentrical, and infructuous. This judge or this poet grants each object its fair proportion, no more and no, no less. It is the arb arbiter and who balances his time and his land. He is not a tendency. He is judging doesn't judge as a judge, but as the sun, he protects an indefense creature. That is part of the poems, one of the poems of Whitman. The thinker considers that the role of poets is similar to the role of judges because it adds the literary Reimagination, and as suggested by Whitman, poetic justice needs to be equipped with a large amount of legal knowledge, history knowledge, and president knowledge. Judges must be good in that aspect, but to be completely rational, judges must be capable of fantasizing and understanding, not only tuning up their technical. Um, abilities, but also the human capabilities. In this case, justice is blind, as said by Martha Newsbaum. I would add to the previous that judges under those terms cannot give up to pure poetic romanticism because this attitude is still something that comes from that impartiality perspective with oneself, of being independent of your own demons or ghosts. We must not lose sight of the sense of law, because otherwise it can be dangerous for men and society that can only be useful for certain attorneys and people that do not act correctly. If it attempts not to be neutralized by economic activities or policy, it must look into justice, not only to provide solutions that are not possible, but to defend what is jurisdictionally available and ethically available. The conflicts within the economic, industrial development and ecological ones and the recognition of the active participation in people's responsibility as consumers or victims of the environmental risks without a doubt leads us to the road of justice. This is an expression of the same duties as to a clean environment. The latter is a new public paradigm that has developed from the theories up to the citizens or collective demands going through rights or economy. I'm referring to environmental justice. One of the main aspects of environmental justice is the power of a person to demand so or require so because this can not only lay upon governments, administrations, or those who hold some sort of a power, but those who have the recognized authority when conflicts are judicialized, meaning they are not sold by other competent authorities. That's the issue with due uh, judicialization. This is what we criticize through uh, academic or political sectors, but this implies the lack of capabilities or capacity that other sectors have not been able to solve previously. Therefore, finally, it's the court of the environment that must follow rule of law, not only materialize and policies and standards and 
the specific decision based on a judge beyond the legal restrictions and also related to principles. This is always enshrined in the protection of the environmental rights. There is a crucial piece of information in carrying out these activities, not only in the regulations and in public policies, but very frequently in the existence of an independent judicature. Therefore, in this concept of environmental justice, we might consider the right to access the people, organizations, safeguarding efficiently, having a say and participating be um, representing the state. That's how the mechanisms established by the society and its states configure environmental rights in guaranteed in, in, in law. Tribunals guarantee the due process, the right to ha be defended and environmental justice in the current model of the constitutional law and some authors have denominated as an environmental rule of law a paradigm in development sets forth life quality issues as a state commitment based on the constitutional text in this way the judges with their decisions are driven and with a basis a scientific legal basis are reality beyond the slogans or the protection measures to have an active state in fostering and living in the appropriate environment, the policies and the legal systems that make possible the environmental tribunal. Therefore, it's possible to state what I mentioned in the first forum on environmental justice in the 2014 Fiat Justicia Experiat Mundus. To make justice though the world ceases expressing or in line with our days as a motto of environmental justice. May justice be made so the world is not destroyed. Thank you very much. We wish to thank the Justice of the Environmental Court of, San, of Santiago, Jose Ignacio Vasquez. We will continue closing with the words of the uh, Chief Justice Alejandro Ruiz Fabres. Good afternoon. Thank you for having resisted, having headed home. We will reward you with a great uh, cocktail party. I wish to greet Minister Vasquez. He is a very important person in the Environmental Tribunal of Santiago, the first Chief Justice he organized and entailed, and he designed and created this concept of the International Forum on Environmental Justice. And he has, of course, left us with an important message, a relevant message in the Environmental Tribunal of Santiago. People uh, esteem him uh, dearly, and he left a a trace, a footprint. By presenting the forum yesterday, I said that the goal was to contribute in making visible the concept of environmental justice. I think that after two days of excellent briefings, panels that I've seen have been of great joy for many of us. We have been able to contribute in that regard, and for them it has been essential to have our briefers, national and international ones, and specific the international ones that have traveled from very far away, some of them, and they've sacrificed other commitments to share their experience. So we wish to thank them as of now once again. We have seen different perspectives 
of what environmental justice implies. It's a concept that maybe from our lens of the environmental tribunal is related to the uh, controversy resolution mechanism, but also underlays an equitable distribution of the environmental burden, or even in broader terms, public environmental management. Those who manage them or people expect for the state to provide environmental protection matters. The environmental tribunals are not the managers, but we do control that management. Therefore, we have a role from that perspective in the broader sense. Last night in the dinner held for the briefers, we touched upon this topic, and we were saying that environmental justice exceeds the the powers that, as an environmental tribunal and the jurisdictional bodies hold. Without a doubt, we have a crucial role in providing environmental justice in these cases, and we cannot lose sight of them. That's why we wanted to disseminate and to make visible this matter that for us has been a pleasure to do so. This has been a very uh, hardworking year for our tribunal, but we have obviously wanted to to provide you and enlighten you with, a, with an interesting program. I appreciate your input in which I've seen an ongoing enthusiasm and support this morning when we had a, a somewhat a debate in terms of the reform of Act 19,300. We discussed the possible incorporation of a new figure, which are the macro zone commissions. I was thinking that many times, at times we discuss and we carry forward different decisions in terms of figures, mechanisms, procedures, and it's so important for the people in those positions are capable, are integral persons. That might be even more important than any other formula or figures to include. Therefore, we also have to be very involved with the selection criteria of those positions. Saying so, I wish to say, and recapping on the importance of people, that this has been the result of a, a teamwork. Maybe I'm the visible face of it, but under which we've being committed with a great deal of effort, and I would request a round of applause for the team of the Environmental Tribunal of Santiago. We hope to see you in the year 2020 in the fourth version, and many thanks for your participation. Farewell. Clausuramos así el tercer forum. We'll therefore close the third, for, third forum on environmental justice organized by the Environmental Justice Tribunal of Santiago. Thank you for being with us two days and the input provided by each one of the panelists to whom we deliver our acknowledgement for the effort entailed to be present in our country. We will see you once again in the year 2020. Good afternoon and farewell.